Hello. We're going to try to record Romans Lesson 20, Chapter 8, Verses 31-39. through 39. We had some technical difficulties this past Sunday, which allowed us not unable to record class. We had many of our members who were gone on a retreat, over 100 members. And so I think this is key to us understanding the rest of the book of Romans. Uh, so much of what Paul has mentioned so far in the book of Romans has led up to this text. And so I really wanted to be able to film this. We had some wonderful class discussion, and I hate that that's not going to be a part of the video uh, for us in this video. And of course, it's a little bit awkward because we're not used to, at least I'm not used to, you know, taping this in this format. And so please just bear with me. Um, but this is such a beautiful and such a rich passage, and I wanted us to be able to look at that together. And so take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Now, as always, it's important for us to have some context to see what the Apostle Paul is talking about. And so when we look at our context here, we see that Paul's been talking about this for the last three or four chapters, that once we come into contact with the blood of Christ, when we're baptized, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and following, it talks about how we've been raised to walk in newness of life. And we begin our walk as Christians in this new spiritual life that's led by the Spirit. And in this new life in the Spirit, we are now in an elevated position. And no longer are we enemies of God, Romans 5.10. But now we are His beloved children. Because we are in Christ, because we have been sanctified and justified and even glorified to this new elevated position as being His child. And Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that we are so happy to be glorified and that now we are no longer enemies but beloved children and yet our full glorification has not taken place. That we're not going to receive the full glorification until that great judgment day, whenever we are made like he is, the Apostle John says in his epistles. And so Paul talks about how we have this deep longing. He talks about creation and humans, and even the Holy Spirit has this deep longing within us for that day when this is going to be made a reality. But the sad thing is it makes heaven that much sweeter. But we also realize that we're still fallen human beings living in a fallen world. And so this, this hope and this expectation of heaven is beautiful and it makes heaven sweeter because we suffer in this life. But at the same time, we know that what we have waiting is so good that it makes it hard sometimes to live in a sin-sick fallen world. And the Apostle Paul says that God has given us different assurances and confidences. And we looked at four of these last week. And we're going to be looking at the fifth one today. These assurances or confidences is that the Spirit super intercedes for us, verses 26 through 27, that God works all things together for good, verse 28, we have the working of God. Number three, we have this ever-present goal in front of us, and of course that is Christ Jesus who we're trying to conform ourselves to. And fourthly, in Christ we have received justification, and justification means that we can stand before God as sinless because we're covered with the blood of Christ, 1 John 1, verse 7. And the fifth assurance and confidence that God has given to us, the Apostle Paul gives one verse, two verses to the first four. But at the last, the last one, the love of God, he gives nine verses that talk about the beauty and the wonder and the majesty that we have God's abiding love, the greatest assurance and the greatest aid that we have that God has given to us in order to endure sufferings in this life is his ever-present and eternal love, verses 31 through 39. Paul saves this for last, and he says this really is at the heart of the Christian life, this ever-present love of God. And so uh, let's read uh, that passage together and then discuss uh, what it has to say. Let's read Romans 8, 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And so he starts off with saying, who should we fear? If God is for us, if he's the one that is in our corner, 
Who can possibly be against us? Who should we fear? And Paul is implying here that no one. Now, sometimes we focus on what is stacked up against us without really understanding who's on our side. And I think the perfect illustration for this is in 2 Kings uh, chapter 6, a story that many of us know well. You had Syria, a kingdom to the north of Israel, and Syria was a larger empire, more men, a larger army, and the king of Syria decided that he was going to attack Israel to the south. And so he gets his army and tries to make different incursions into Israel. And every time he moves with his army, the Israelites are always two steps ahead. So much so that he thinks there is a spy in his palace. And one of his advisors say, no, king, there's no spy. There's a prophet in Israel. His name is Elisha. And he's a prophet of God and he knows every word you speak, even the, the words you speak in your bedroom. And so the king decides, well, he can't make a successful military campaign if he's got this guy in Israel that is telling the king of Israel all of his moves. So he sends a detachment of soldiers to the house of Elijah to arrest him. And so the soldiers come and they encircle the house. And Elijah, he, he's not afraid at all, but his servant is scared. I mean, he's looking outside of his door and you have the army of Syria outside the front door and he's beside himself. And Elijah prays for God to open up his eyes, and God does. And all of a sudden, the servant can look around and see on the mountains around the valley of where they live, the mountains are covered with thousands, tens of thousands, of an angelic army, you know, angels and their fiery chariots. And that's why Elisha has not been afraid, because he realizes who's on his side. And yeah, of course, the, the Syrian army is right outside of his house, but he's not afraid because God's army is with him. And so you have this illustration of God is on our side. You know, many times we can see that physical army or whatever it is that we think is stacked up against us and, you know, we're fearful and we're afraid and we're dejected and God says, hey, I'm on your team. I'm on your side. You know, don't, don't become so overwhelmed with life and its hardships and who you think is against you, even Satan himself. The Bible says that no one can snatch us out of the Father's hand, John chapter 10. We need to realize that if God is with us, greater is he that is with us than he that is in the world. The second thing he says here in verse 32 is God's ultimate display of love. God did not withhold his own son to die on a cruel cross, a terrible death, in order to redeem you and I from sin while we were still enemies of God, Romans 5 verse 10. The Apostle Paul says, if God loved you so much while you were a sinner and while you were an enemy of God to send his only son to die on the cross for you, if that's what God did when He, when you were his enemy, how much more do you think God is going to do for you now that you are his beloved child? Remember the verses previous to this section, the Apostle Paul has talked about how if we are in Christ Jesus, we are now the beloved children of God. And since we are his beloved children, we have an inheritance. That we have a share in the eternal inheritance of Christ because we are now God's children. Paul says, if God loved you enough to send his son to die for you while you were an enemy, think of how much he's willing to do for you to work all things together for good, verse 28, because you are now his child, which he loves. There's a poem that I like, and it says, who delivered up Jesus to die? Not Judas for money, not Pilate for fear, and not the Jews for envy, but God for love. If God did all that because he loves us, how much more will he continue to do for us now that he loves us as his children? Well, let's read verses 34, through, I'm sorry, 33 through 35. 33 through 35 of our text. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, the one who was raised, who is the right hand of God, who is interceding for us. Who sh shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 33, it says, God is the one who justifies. 
Justification is the state of being sinless before God, of being innocent, just as if we have never sinned. The famous phrase Marshall Keeble used to always say. And the Greek word that is used here, ekaleo, the idea of bringing a charge is a judicial term. And it goes to show us that, yes, we have an accuser, right? Satan, the Satan, right? It's Hebrew for the accuser. And so we have a great accuser who's going to accuse us on the judgment day, but it's not going to matter because Satan may be the accuser, but God is the justifier. He is the one that grants justification. He is the one who makes the final say. He's the one who gives the final judgment. And the Bible says here that our Heavenly Father is going to be in the judge, judge's robe, that our Heavenly Father is going to be the one who listens to the accuser and then says, that's enough. That's my son. That's my daughter. I love them, and they are justified before me because they are in Christ Jesus. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. In duo is the Greek word there, that we have clothed ourselves, that we've put on Christ, and therefore we have the joy and the promise and the inheritance that belongs to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so Paul has shown us in verses 28 through 30 that there's still going to be hardships in life. There's still going to be difficulties and trials and tribulations. There's still going to be mean people who will accuse us of things and, and try to be stumbling blocks in our way, and yet we don't have to fear any of them, even Satan himself, because God is the justifier. And in keeping with that theme in verse 34, the Apostle Paul says, Who is going to condemn us? Christ came to earth in order to die for us, and now he is exalted at the right hand of God, that all of creation is under his authority and his power. And what is Christ doing with his time? He's interceding for you and I. Sometimes we think that Christ stopped working on our behalf at the cross. And he's been absent for 2,000 years and haven't given us much thought. The Bible tells us that's not the case at all. That he's our high priest. The book of Hebrews says that he is ever present before the Father pleading our case. Here Paul says that he is making intercession for us. And so while we live this life, that Christ our Lord is beside the Father pleading our case on our behalf. Now who's going to condemn us? That Christ Jesus is the one that redeemed us and is making intercession for us. And keeping with that idea of Christ and his work in verse 35, the shift has now changed. Before, we were talking about the love of God, verse 28 and verse 31. And here Paul singles out a, a person of the Godhead. In verse 35, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, obviously, Christ is God, John 1, 1 through 3. But here he explicitly states what is going and who is going to say, uh, separate us from the love of God. And so what we get here is this picture in Romans 8 of the Trinity, all working together. You have the mention of the Holy Spirit in verse 26, God the Father in verse 31, and God the Son in verse 35. All persons of the Trinity working together for one purpose, and that is your salvation. How comforting is that? You know, if you really go back and look at the first three chapters of Romans, the Apostle Paul is, is kind of negative, it seems like. I mean, he's really hammering the idea home time and time again that Every person, Jew or Gentile, is a sinner. And because you're a sinner, you're lost and you're condemned, and there's nothing you can do about it. And then he just changes in chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 to really encourage. Talk about all the blessings and promises we have in Christ. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Uh, the beauty of being a, a child of God and with the inheritance that we share with Christ. And then the, the assurances and the blessings that we have culminating in the love of God. And so, I mean, Paul is really trying to encourage the, the church in Rome and also us today through uh, inspiration about how wonderful and blessed it is to be recipients of this amazing love. He says that no hardships, no suffering, whether it's tribulation or distress or nakedness, famine, sword, none of those things are going to separate us from the love of God. And he uses this quotation from Psalm 44, 22 that reiterates that very point. And I think this is very important because Oftentimes in our life, whenever we do face these trials and tribulations, whenever we do have to deal with hardships and loss and pain, for some reason as humans, one of the very first things that we start to question 
is God's love and his presence. If God was really with me, if God really loved me, I wouldn't have to go through these things. The Apostle Paul, writing through inspiration, says, don't do that. Don't do that to yourself because that's a lie. Because when you're in the midst of trials and tribulations, you have Satan in one ear trying to say, well, God doesn't love you. I mean, this is, this is proof positive. If God loved you, if God was with you, then you wouldn't have to deal with these things. And God says, no, that's not true. Life is a hard life. The world is full of sin and evil people. And there's going to be suffering and death and disappointments until the last day. Everybody's going to face those things. They come in different forms and shapes and fashions. And sadly, some people have to deal with those on a much deeper scale than others. But all of us have to deal with hardships, trials, and tribulations. Every last one. And God says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to make sure that everything in the end is going to be okay. And that's the promise that we have for him. And the Apostle Peter talks about the precious and very great promises that we have from God in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-5. through 5. The important thing for us to remember is that God is always with us and His love is always present. When I was a child growing up in my grandmother's house, she had the same poem in about six different places in her home. And the poem is called Footprints. It's probably one of the most popular poems uh, that's out there. And in that poem, the writer talks about how they live life, and there was always two footprints in the sand, except for the times in life that were the hardest, the times of loss and pain and difficulty and hardships. And when she got to the end of the beach and the end of her life, she looked back and she said, Lord, you promised you would always be with me. And as I look back over the, 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 the shoreline and the times of my life where it was the hardest, there was only one set of footprints. Now, why did you leave me during the hardest moments of my life? And in the poem, it says, My dear child, that one set of footprints is not the times that I left you, it's the times that I carried you. Now, obviously, the poem is not inspired, but I do think it does get directly to the heart of what the Apostle Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 8, that whether we deal with these you know, hardships, these famines, nakedness, distress, persecution, danger, sword, even in those moments, they have not separated us from the love of Christ. They have not. And in those moments, we have to come back to this passage and realize that one of the great reassurances that we have, all people in life are going to suffer. All people in life are going to bury their loved ones. All people in life are going to experience things that are unfair. Everybody does. But only those who are the children of God get to experience those hardships with the confidence and the assurance that God loves them and God is not going to leave them, and everything in the end is going to be okay because we have the inheritance of eternal life in Christ Jesus, 1 John 2, verse 25. And then we see in verse 37, it says, Through all these things we are conquerors. And so these sufferings and these hardships have not shipwrecked our faith. No, instead of shipwrecking our faith, they have shown us to be conquerors. Well, how, how can we conquer? Well, the Apostle Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8-10. through 10. He says, In my moments of weakness I have learned to rely on God and to realize that He is the source of my strength. If I am the source of my own strength, it is in those moments of, of weakness and despair that I have no hope because I'm obviously not strong enough to deal with it myself. The Apostle Paul says it's those moments where I realize the true power and the strength of being a child of God of being in Christ Jesus and knowing that my weaknesses exemplify the strength of God. And Paul says, I'm happy to boast in my weaknesses because it shows the power of Christ. And so we are conquerors of life and we conquer those hardships. You know, James 1, 2, and 3 says, you know, blessed is the man who stands fast under trial. And when he has proved himself to stand underneath those trials, he will receive the crown of life. You know, we're conquerors. These, these hardships in life don't break us. They mold us and they, they, they harden us like iron and they help us to be conquerors through Christ. And then, of course, verses 38 through 39, one of the most beautiful verses in all of Scripture. I mean, it's so beautiful, we might as well just read it again, shouldn't we? For I'm sure neither life nor death 
nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Important thing for us to remember, where is God's love found? It's found in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we are in Christ, Romans chapter 6, 3 through 11, then we are his beloved children and we have access to a love that is greater than any love we could ever know. Does God love the world? Yes, John 3, 16. He loved the world so much he gave his only son. Does God love everybody? Yes. Does God love everybody the same? No. The Bible tells us here in Romans chapter 8 that God loves everybody, but he loves his children more. God loves everybody, and he sent his son to save everybody, or at least give them the opportunity for everyone to be saved. But the people who have obeyed the gospel and who have buried themselves with Christ in baptism are now in an exclusive relationship to God through Jesus Christ, Romans 6, verse 11. And because of that, they now have God's love to a depth and a degree that is not made available to the rest of creation. And that is a beautiful thing. And not only is it a beautiful thing, you have the assurance that it's not going to be taken away, that no one can take that from you. No hardship, no amount of suffering can remove that great blessing from you. And so Paul goes into great descriptive lengths to stress that nothing in all of creation is going to be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in all of creation, including Satan. Now, Satan is a part of creation, so nothing in all of creation. And so uh, God gave his own son that we might experience his love, his mercy, and his grace. As we think about the conclusions of our class, the first thing is, is that in Christ we are God's beloved children. We must not forget that. We must remember that every day of our lives that my life is special, that my life is important, that I'm redeemed by the blood of Christ, and because of that, I'm a child of God. That is a blessing that we must never take for granted. Number two, that as His beloved children, we have assurance and we have confidences. And what are those five assurances? Number one, that the Holy Spirit of God resides within us and that He intercedes for us, verses 26 through 27 that God is working all things together for good to those who love the Lord and are called to His purpose, verse 28. Number three, that God has given us a model for us to aim for, Christ Jesus, Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, talks about that also in verse 29 of our text, that in Christ we have received justification, the full pardon of our sins, and we have received glory, an elevated status. Now we are God's children, and we await the full glorification. We're going to be changed to be like Christ for all of eternity. And the fifth confidence that Paul spends so much time on is that we have God's ever-present love that will not be taken away. The next takeaway is that if God is with us, there is no one we have to fear. Now, how reassuring is that? That God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Second Timothy chapter 1 Verse 7. Number 4. Nothing will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ. The hardships of life are not evidence of the lack of God's love for us. That is a lie that Satan plants in our minds. It is the love of God that sees us through those hardships with the hope, which is the anchor of the soul. Hebrews 6 verse 19. And nothing in creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And lastly, through God, we are conquerors of life and of death. Life and death are both difficult, but in Christ, you can conquer both. What a wonderful message about the love of God and what that should mean to us as we live each and every day in His service as we strive to become more and more like Christ. Now, thank you for bearing with me in this uh, new setup for Lesson 20 in our study through the book of Romans. May God bless you.